All right, so first section uh, we're going to continue looking at this week is 1.3. We already looked at part of it last week. We looked at what, what a function is. So basically it means it passes the vertical line test. You draw a vertical line and only hits it once. Um, and that's the kind of graphs that the calculator can draw. Only things that pass the vertical line test. We can kind of cheat and draw like, like sideways parabolas and circles, but you kind of have to draw it as two separate graphs. You can't really do it as one. So we're going to focus just on, on functions. So let's start by graphing this one. So it says to graph 16x minus x cubed, and then determine the domain and range. So remember, the highest exponent, wherever that is in the, in the problem, tells you, if you subtract 1 from it, how many times the graph could turn. So this graph could turn twice. Let's graph it and um, let's see what it looks like. So we've got 16x minus x cubed. If it does turn, it's important we see it on the screen. Uh, so it's definitely turning, but it's off the screen. So if we're looking for a complete graph, uh, that's not it. Okay, it's not, not zoomed out enough. Um, I think left and right looks good, but let's go a little higher and a little lower. How high and low do you have to go? Well, it just I would just try to take a guess. Um, try like maybe negative 40 and positive 40. Okay, if that's not enough, then, then we'll set them a little bigger. What we're looking for is to try to see where it turns. Perfect. Now we can see exactly where the turns are. So in terms of a complete graph, we, we've got it. Okay, the complete graph is the four numbers, the x min and x max, that was negative 10. So I'll write down those two and those two. That's, that's your window. All right, um, so now it says to determine the domain and range. Okay. When you're finding domain, I've said it a few times, there's only two things you have to be careful about. One, did you divide by zero? So did you have a variable in the bottom of a fraction somewhere? Or two, do you have square roots in there? Because if you've got a square root, you're not allowed to take the square root of a negative. Um, Shy, do we have any fractions in the problem we just graphed? <coughs> nope. Do we have any square roots? Yes. Where? The uh, x cubed. OK, x cubed. Is that, do you pronounce it though as square root of x? No. But no. But it's, it's x cubed, it's not a square root. So there's no square root, there's no fractions. So the domain here is all real numbers. You can take any number you want and multiply it by 16. Positives, negatives, fractions. And you can take any number you want and cube it. You can cube 2, you can cube negative 8, you can cube 0.5, you can cube 0. Okay, there's nothing you can't plug in for x. So domain. You can write all reals, or it's a little shorter, use that notation. Remember, the parentheses means you can't reach it, which is true. You never reach infinity. So we always put parentheses. Any questions on why the domain is all reals? All right, so what that means on the, on the graph is this graph goes left and right forever. If the domain is all reals, it might not go left and right fast, but it's still going down and to the right. Okay, so it's, it's going to the right. Now the range. The range is up and down. Okay? So if you can plug in anything you want for x, what kind of numbers do you get right here for y? That's the range. And the graph kind of helps us look at that. Well, right now we're looking at negative 40 to 40. Let's, um, let's make it even bigger. Let's make it negative 80 to 80. Okay, we're trying to see, does it, does it ever stop going up or down? Okay, so now we're looking at negative 80 to 80. What do you think? Does it, does it look like it's going to stop going up on the left and down on the right? Um, kind of? Yeah. No, it never stops going up, it never stops going down, 
and it's connected the whole time. So what do you think that would mean the range is? Yeah. All real numbers. It's all real numbers again. Goes up forever, goes down forever. And it's connected. So the range is all real numbers. Good. Any question on that one? So we'll practice finding more domain and range during the week. All right, so let's look at a, um, a word problem. So this problem says that you've got a uh, swimming pool, and the dimensions of the pool are 30 by 50 feet. And there's a sidewalk around the pool, and the sidewalk is the same width all the way around the pool. We don't know the width of the sidewalk, so we'll just call the width x. But they do tell us the area of the sidewalk. Okay, so they area of the sidewalk around the pool is 600 square feet. And the question is, what is the width of the sidewalk? So given all the information they're telling you, that's what they want us to figure out. All right, so you've given us a lot of facts here, kind of written out in sentence form. Um, what do you think would be a good good idea to try in this problem that would help make this information a little easier to, to see what's going on. Well, how? Yeah. Sure. You know that? Yeah, go ahead. Con? Draw a picture. Yeah, let's draw a picture. So anytime you can visualize something, that usually makes it a little easier to figure out you know what's going on. So let's start with a pool. We've got a pool 30 by 50 feet. So that'll be like that. That's 30. That's 50. And there's a sidewalk all the way around the pool and it's the same width all the way around. So I'll just draw it the best I can all the way around. <coughs> Not perfect, but close time. It says the width of the sidewalk is x. So it's x units all, all the way around. Not going to put it everywhere, but you get the idea. So now they tell us the area of the sidewalk is 600 square feet. And I'll just shade in the pool blue, so remember that's the pool. So first thing we have to do is figure out how we can use this number, okay, area of the sidewalk. So we've, we've got to come up with an equation that we can put that number into. So area, actually you know what, to shorten it up, let me do it like this, area of sidewalk. Now we have two rectangles in that picture. Does anybody see what we could do with the two rectangles to somehow get the area of the sidewalk? Yep, the thing? Well, we could just do the math for the inside, the rectangle that's inside, and subtract it from the area of the entire rectangle of the sidewalk in a way. Yeah, exactly. If we take the area of, we'll call it, we don't have a better name for it, but the area of the big rectangle. And if we take the area of the, the big rectangle and then subtract out the area of the pool, we are left with just the area of the sidewalk. So kind of just, that's the idea of what we're going to do. Now we have to start filling in some, some numbers. But any questions on that equation? And I think in the homework, they give you a problem that's the same thing, except it's a photo. <coughs> being mounted on a piece of like construction paper, so you get a border, and they ask you to do the same thing. Like they tell you the area of the border around the photo, it's just not the area of the sidewalk around the pool. It's like the same thing. Okay, so let's start with the area of our sidewalk. Um, Isabel, what, what's the area of the sidewalk? Uh, 600. 600. So let's fill that in. Now, 
the area of the big rectangle, I don't really know that yet, but I'm just going to leave a spot for the length times the width, because that's the area of a rectangle. I'll come back to that. And now the area of the pool. Um, I don't have the area of the pool, but I can figure it out. It's 30 times 50. Okay. Um, so what do I get if I do 30 times 50? 1,500. 1,500, yep. All right. So now we need the length and the width of the big rectangle. Let's start with the length. So the length, kind of give you a hint, of the big rectangle is this part, which we should know the length of, plus that part, plus that part. Anyone think they know what the length of the big rectangle is going to be? Yeah? Yeah. It's x plus x, that's the sidewalk, and then plus 50. So it's 2x plus 50. And the width, we do pretty much the same way. You have that part of the width, then that part, and that part. So what's the, what's the width of the big rectangle? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. 2x plus 30. 2x plus 30. Now we've got an equation. It just has a single variable, <coughs> x. Now we can solve it. So let's do it out and um, see what happens. So we get 600 equals, and remember this part, you have to FOIL it out. So we got 2x times 2x. And um, Emily, what's 2x times 2x? 4x squared. Yep, 4x squared. Then we've got 2x times 30. So that's 60x. And then we've got 2x times 50. So that's 100x. And then we've got 50 times 30, well, we just did that calculation earlier. 50 times 30 is 1,500. And then don't forget the minus 1,500 that we have. All right, um, anybody see something on the right-hand side that I can, I can simplify? Yeah, Mike? Uh, yeah, this kind of problem, that always happens. <laughs> The 1500 minus 1500 is gone. Um, one more thing I can do on the right hand side. Okay? Combine one Yep, I can combine 60 and 100 x to get 160 x, and now I have a quadratic equation. There's my squared term, linear term, constant. Um, when we solve a quadratic, it's usually not equal to 600. Does anyone remember what number we usually get it equal to when we're trying to solve it? Zero. Yeah, we usually get it equal to zero. So we can get it equal to zero by subtracting the 600 to the other side. So 4x squared plus 160x and subtract over the 600. Okay, now at this step, um, <coughs> A couple of things we could do. If you look at all your numbers, 4, 160, 600, does anybody see what, uh, what they're all divisible by? Yeah? Yeah, they're all divisible by 4. So if you want to make your numbers smaller, you can divide everything by 4. Now that doesn't solve the problem yet, but it just gives you numbers that are a little smaller. All right, um, what's one way that you can solve a quadratic equation? I remember one, one method you can use if the numbers are, are nice and it, and it works out? Involving parentheses. Yeah? Yeah, do you remember what that's called when you put it back in the sets of parentheses? Factoring. Factoring. So if the numbers are nice, you can try to factor. Um, so you'd be trying to find two numbers that multiply to give you 150 and subtract to give you 40. 
uh, it might be a little hard to figure that one out. So what else can you do if you can't factor it? Remember a certain formula you can use on that kind of equation? Yeah? The quadratic formula? Yeah, you could use the quadratic formula. Okay. And if the problem specifically said something about getting an exact answer, that's what I would have to do. You'd have to use the quadratic formula. But we're going to use um, the graphing calculator. So let me show you how to, how to do it on there. So we're going to type in the equation x squared plus 40x minus 150. x squared plus 40x minus 150. Now, when something has an exponent of 2, that's a parabola shape. So that's what I'm expecting to see, some kind of parabola. So I'm going to start with zoom 6, and I'm looking for where the parabola equals 0. That means where it crosses the x-axis. Okay. These are your x values. That's your y value. So if the y value is 0, you're looking for where it crosses somewhere on the x-axis. Now, how many times can a parabola cross the x-axis? Yep, mm -hmm. two. two, up to two times. So let's look at our picture. <coughs> see what we got? All right, I see one spot that it crosses, and I see it kind of angled. So my guess is the parabola crosses in the negative part somewhere else. Let's see if I can see it. Let's try negative 100 and see if it's on the screen. Okay, I, I didn't need to go that far. But I can see the other point. Now, you still might not be sure it's a parabola because it, it dips down very low. It's not really critical we see the bottom, but I'm just going to try to find it to show you. Or at least get kind of close to it. Uh, close enough now, I think you can, you can see it's a perfect one. Okay. Uh, but the important thing is where it crosses the axes. In that picture, it's really hard for me to see where it crosses the axis. Uh, I don't want to be zoomed out this much, so I'm going to zoom uh, back in. Right. Let's just set it at like negative, negative 10, leave it where it was. And now we're looking, at, we're looking at two possible answers for where it crosses the x-axis. So does that mean the sidewalk could have two different widths? Bless you. Yeah. Because one is negative. One is negative, and we're looking for the width of the sidewalk, so does negative width make sense? No. So we don't need to really even look at the negative one. All right. Even though I found it, just to show you it's there. And it is a solution to the quadratic equation, but it doesn't make sense in the word problem. All right, so what we're going to do is go second calc, and we want to figure out where it crosses the y-axis, or x-axis. That's the second option down, zero. Okay, and the way this works is you have to pick a point to the left of where it crosses the axis, to the right, and then a guess. So I'm at negative 45. I want to get closer to over here. Looks like it's around 3 or 4. So I'm going to move over a little bit. Um, when you get it, it doesn't have to be super close. I mean, that's, that's probably fine. I know I'm way off the screen. I can't even see my cursor. But x is at negative 10. If I hit enter, you can see it just put a dotted line at negative 10. So now what it's going to do is it's going to look between negative 10, and now I need to go to the right of where it crosses the axis. Just watch the number until I get, okay, now I'm at 0.83. I want to go more. Oh, I just saw my cursor. 
So my cursor just got on the screen, and now it's going to keep traveling along the parabola, so it's going to go way up high again. But I don't even need to see it. Okay. Six, well, let's go seven and a half. So anywhere around seven or more, that's fine. Now we'll put a dotted line, make it bigger so you can see it, to the right of where it crossed zero. So now it's basically going to look between those two dotted lines. If you don't get it between the dotted lines, it won't work. Okay, you've got to sandwich that blue line that's solid between the two dotted ones. Now it's asking for a guess. Um, the guess doesn't really matter. You can just hit enter. And it tells me that it crosses the x-axis at exactly 3.45. And that's the answer. So the width of the sidewalk is about 3.45 feet. Okay. Again, if you wanted it exact, then you're using a quadratic formula. Otherwise, we can do it just like that on the calculator. Any questions on that? Hey, did we talk about calculating a zero last week? Couldn't remember if we did that or not. Well, if we didn't, now you know how, how to do it. We'll probably do it again today. Okay, so next thing uh, in this section is projectile motion. So basically, projectile motion is kind of think of like, a, like if a baseball player throws a ball in from the outfield kind of travels like this. They usually throw it up a little bit so they can throw it further and it, and it arcs. Well, this formula that I'm about to give you is the formula for that, for that arc. And that's the formula. So on the left-hand side, the function s of t, that's the height of the object. So what this formula does is you tell me a certain time, like two seconds after you release it, three seconds, however many seconds you want after you throw the ball, and I'll tell you how high it will be. Right, so there's a few variables that affect how high this is going to go. Well, one is the time. What time do you want me to look at the object? Two seconds after you throw it, five seconds, 12 seconds, how much time has gone by. The other thing that affects it is how hard you threw it. Did you throw it really light or did you throw it really hard? And the last thing that affects how high it's going to go is how high was it when, it when it was let go? Did you throw it off the top of a building? If so, then that's, that's got a lot of height to start with. Or was it on the ground like a rocket, maybe on like a little stand, and you launch the rocket from the ground? Okay, well, so what was the initial height? If you're throwing a, an object, most people, you know, if you throw it, it might be at a height of like five feet or six feet, depending on how tall you are. Baseball player, when they throw it, they might bend over a little bit more, so they're releasing it a little lower to the ground. They're not releasing it up near their head. A little bit lower. Okay, but that's what S sub zero is. Initial height, V sub zero, initial speed. Okay. And sometimes the initial height is zero. So like if you had like a little thing on the ground and you were just launching it, it might be an initial height of zero. All of the problems I give you will be in units of feet and seconds. So if you take physics, a lot of times they use metric system you wouldn't use this formula, okay? Because they use like meters instead of feet. Okay, so let's look at an example. So it says a model rocket is shot straight up from the ground. So that kind of tells you what the initial height is. It's starting on the ground. And the speed of the rocket, the second, like the second it lifts off from the ground is 64 feet per second. So that's the speed at which it's being fired at. 
Okay, we want to find out a couple things. Okay, first thing I want to know is when the rocket will be 50 feet above the ground. Okay, so let's fill in what we can in our formula and uh, see what we can figure out. So the first part of the formula, negative 16 t squared. You're not filling in t because that's the question. What time? You don't know time. The next part is v sub 0 t. v sub 0 is the initial speed. Okay. What was the initial speed of this rocket? 64, yep. Yeah. Plus s sub 0 goes on the end. s sub 0 is the initial height. What's the initial height that the rocket is starting from? Zero. How do you know zero? It's starting from the ground. So it's on the ground when it starts. So we don't even need to put plus zero. And then right here, that's what we're going to plug in from the question. When is the height 50 feet? So fill that in. So think about when you launch a rocket. What's going to happen? You launch it, and the rocket starts to do what? It goes up. And then eventually what happens? It comes back down. So it might hit 50 feet how many times? Twice. It might hit it on the way up, and then it might hit it again on the way down. The only time it would hit it once is if the rocket goes exactly 50 feet high. And it would just go up, it would hit 50, and then fall back down. But if it goes higher than 50, it'll hit it twice. Okay. So let's put this in on the calculator and uh, see what happens. So I'm going to put in negative 16. Remember, you always use x for the variable on the calculator. So negative 16x squared plus 64x. That's going to be my parabola because right? it has an exponent of 2. That's going to be the path that the rocket travels. I want to know when it hits 50. So I'm going to put a line at 50. And this line is going to go right through my parabola. Now, we're putting a line up at 50. So if my y max is only at 10, you're never going to see the line. Um, what would be a good value for the y max? So the 50 is not right on the edge of the screen. Yeah, 60, sure. Um, now, negative 10, why is height? Does negative height make sense? Not unless the rocket's going to drill into the ground, and that's not happening. So it doesn't make sense to look at negative. Um, T is the time. Does negative 100 make sense for time? No, you're not looking at anything with negative time. You can start at time zero. And then x max is how long it's really in the air for. Okay, we don't know. Um, let's assume it's in the air less than 10 seconds. If it's in the air more than 10, it's going to go off the screen. Otherwise, we should see the whole problem. All right, so i got to adjust something. I didn't quite set something high enough. It's high enough that I could answer the question. I can definitely see where it hits 50 feet. But if you want to see the top of the parabola, in other words, how high the rocket goes, <coughs> which value would I have to make a little bigger? The y max. The y max. So let's make it. Um, yeah, let's make it 75. And I, I think that'll. Yeah, that's good enough. We can see it. Again, the way it was before wasn't bad. It would have answered the question, but now it's, it's a little better. Okay, I want to see where the blue and the red cross. So let's go to second, calc. And which option there do you think will allow me to figure this out? Intersect. Intersect. So fifth option, right? If I press my cursor to the left, I'm off the screen. I can tell I'm off the screen because look at my y value. It's negative 11. It's off the screen. So if I keep coming back, eventually I see my cursor. So 
Pick a point on the blue curve, hit enter, doesn't matter where. Pick a point on the red curve, hit enter, and now the guess. Do you think the guess matters here? Yes. Yes, it does. Wherever you put the guess closer to, it's going to give you that one. So I'm going to do the one on the right. If somebody else could put the guess closer to the one on the left and get that one. Okay. So I guess I did the one on the right. And on the way back down, the rocket hits 50 feet at 2.94 seconds. That's on the way back down. 1.06. Perfect. Now, technically, what we could do is if we average those two numbers, because we have two points that are symmetric, we could actually find the time when it hits the maximum, because it's going to be halfway between 1.06 and 2.94, because those are symmetric points. And that's part of what the next question is getting at. When is the maximum height? And what is the maximum height? So when is the time? What is how high it goes? Well, based on what I just said, if you have two points that are symmetric on a parabola and you average them, it'll give you what's the vertex. So if you add 1.06 and 2.94, you get 4, and if you divide it by 2 to get the average, it should be 2 seconds. 2 seconds is halfway between those two numbers. But we can use the calculator to find the maximum automatically. So let's do it that way and see if, see if it makes sense with what I just said. Second, calc, and the fourth option down is maximum. This is very similar to uh, everything we do. You've got to pick a point to the left, to the right, and take a guess. Now, mine's set up. It's already on the blue. So as I move my cursor, it's following the parabola. If I hit up or down, now it's on the line. The line isn't what I want to be on for this problem. Okay? We want to be on the parabola. So pick a point to the left, pick a point that you think is to the right, and now the guess isn't really important because you've, you've narrowed down where the maximum is, so it'll find it. And that's what we get. So let's look at these numbers and see if we can figure out what they mean. So let's start with the, the two. What do we think the two is? Yeah. All right, so if yours says 1.9999978, it's not because you did anything wrong. It's just remember, the calculator is just guessing. That's all the calculator can really do. It can guess a million times a second, so it's really fast at guessing. If it says something like that, just round it to 2, because that will happen sometime. So what do we think the 2 is? Is that like how high it goes, 2 feet? Or, yeah, shy? Like how, much, how long it is, like that, that's when the maximum height is reached. That's when the maximum height is reached. So the rocket reaches a max height, max height of, and that's the other number, 64. So the rocket reaches a max height of 64 feet at two seconds. You couldn't have answered that question if the maximum was cut off on the screen. You've got to be able to see the maximum on the screen in order to get it. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, so last thing in this section, and then yep, we'll look at part of that one, uh, is a piecewise defined function. So basically, the simplest way to describe a piecewise function is you're graphing two graphs at the same time. 
taking this part, this part, the graphing them and putting them together. And when I show you an example, I think that'll make more sense. Okay, so there's an example of a piecewise defined function. Right here, f of x. This particular piecewise function is split into two parts. One, two. I just put boxes around them. And the idea is that if x is a certain value, you use one of these formulas. If x is a different value, you use the other one. And the way this particular piecewise function is split is right here. If you give me a value less than 1, I will plug it into the top formula. If you give me a value greater than or equal to 1, I'll plug it into the bottom. Okay, um, so yeah, as I was saying, you give me a value less than 1, I'll plug it into the top formula to get the answer. You give me a value greater than or equal to 1, I plug it into the bottom one. So it's just you use a certain formula sometimes, and then you use a different formula for the other values. That's all a piecewise function is. <coughs> Any question on the, the concept? Okay, so what we're going to do is graph this piecewise function. Um, and it's a little different than graphing a regular function on the calculator. Not much, but a, li a little bit. All right. So the big difference is you have to put it in parentheses. Okay, so let's put it in parentheses. So 3 minus x squared in parentheses. And now next to it, you have to tell the calculator when to use that one. We only want to use that one when x is less than 1. So put another parenthesis, put an x, and now I have to show you where the less than symbol is. Okay, all the inequality symbols are under second test. That's second math. It's the third button down on the left-hand side. Less than is the fifth option. So less than... One, close parenthesis. Okay. Now in Y2, um, do the same thing. Open a parenthesis, type in X cubed, make sure you get out of the exponent, minus 4X. Now tell the calculator when to use that function. So parenthesis, put your X, and now we're going to go back into the inequality symbols. Second, math. And this time I want greater than or equal. That's the fourth option. One. Okay, any questions on typing that in, getting those symbols? Okay, so now I'm going to do zoom six. So my window is back to this standard window. So we all kind of look the same. Zoom 6. And that is the first part of the graph. And notice all of a sudden it just stops. It stops at 1. And then the red one starts at 1. That's a piecewise function. It's two different graphs. Sometimes they connect, sometimes they don't. This one doesn't. But it's two graphs drawn at the same time. Now, the calculator did a pretty good job, but this shouldn't be here. There's no way I don't know how to make it not be there. So the part that it traced along the axis, it, it should just be black. Okay, so that's the first thing. So that, that looks a little better. And the second thing the calculator should do, but it doesn't, is this. And see if you can tell me why. I'm doing this. Uh, open circle. Filled in circle. 
Why, why did I do that? And it has to go back, it goes back to something in the original problem. Yeah? Does it differentiate between the last thing of the command and the last thing of the equal to? Yeah, so the question, if you don't do that, and you look at this graph, you say, all right, well, when x is 1, should I go up to the blue graph or should I go down to the red graph? Which one am I on? Well, if you put the little circle on it, now you know, oh, okay, when x is 1, there's, a, there's an open circle. That means don't include it here. But then there's a closed circle on the red one. It means, okay, include it there. So that's just showing the inequality symbol. It's an equal to, you fill it in. If it's not equal to, you leave it open. You'd never have something like this. Because now it could be one in both spots. That, that's a problem. There's no, there's no overlap like that. Okay. So that's a, a piecewise function. Yeah? I don't graph. You always won't graph? No. All right, and you typed everything in in parentheses just like that? OK. Uh, and you did zoom six? Yeah. Do you want to see it? Sure, let me take a look and see. Maybe it's something simple. My hip graph, it does that. All right. So, yep. So you got to make sure whenever you type in a, a minus sign that you use minus and not negative. You're all set now. Yep. If you type in a minus, it's going to do something like this. It's going to say syntax error. Syntax means the wrong symbol's in the wrong spot. Something's not right. And that, that's the problem that, um, that we just, just had. Okay, so any questions on our last, that last part, 1.3? Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at, um, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, just kind of a review section, um, is like slope, y-intercept, y equals mx plus b, um, basically graphing lines, things like that. Okay, I know this is more like Algebra 1 stuff, that's why we're only going to spend about 25 minutes on it, where in Algebra 1, I teach a whole lesson, a whole, a whole day on this. Okay, so that's the equation of a line. Okay, that's called slope-intercept form. And what, is the, uh, what does the M stand for? Yeah, Connor. Is that the y-intercept? Um, no, not the y-intercept, but there is the y-intercept is up there for something else. Shy? M is rise over run. So. And what's rise over run? Okay, right, so rise is when you go up. Run is when you go across. So. Okay. It's and like the slope. Exactly. M is the slope, and B. That's what Connor said. That's the y-intercept. What's a simpler way? What, I don't understand. Intercept? What does that mean? Where it crosses, where it crosses the y-axis. So if you got something like that, there's your y-intercept. There's your x-intercept. So a linear function is anything that you can write in y equals mx plus b. It's anything that can be written in y equals mx plus b. Now, the only thing you have to be careful about is m can't be 0. If you make m 0, then what you're going to do is 0 times x. You wipe that whole thing out. Now you have y equals a number, okay? like we did in the rocket example, y equals 50. That's not a linear function. That's called a constant function. It's just a horizontal line. Linear functions are not horizontal. They go on some kind of angle. Okay. Constant functions are horizontal. What about vertical lines? Vertical lines are not functions because they fail the vertical line test. Because a vertical line, if you put a vertical line, it hits it infinitely many times. And that's not a function. But b can be any number you want. Positive, negative, fraction, decimal. Doesn't matter what b is. All right, so let's look at this real quick. Um, so you don't really have to write the whole thing down. It's really just the numbers that are important. So a house was purchased 10 years ago for 60000 
And then it says, now, this year, the house is worth 85000 So we're going to assume that this problem has a linear relationship, meaning the value of the house basically goes like this over time. The value of the house just goes straight up. That's not really probably true, just to simplify it. So let's find an equation that would basically go through two points. That's exactly what those are right there. We've got two house values, and we've got two time values. So you want to set up two coordinates, kind of like this, time, comma, money. And in this case, money is the value of the house. <coughs> okay, so if you think of it kind of like a, a number line, those are all the years. That's right away. So that's the value of the house when no time had gone by, when we purchased it day one. This is the value of the house 10 years later. What was the value of the house when we started? How much was it worth? 60,000. 60, so in the very beginning, zero represents no time has gone by, the house was valued at 60,000. And then we have a value for how many years later? 10. 10 years later, the house is worth how much? 85,000. So basically, we have to find a line that goes right through those points. So that brings up the next thing, which is slope. <coughs> so if you've got two coordinates, like we do right here, and you want to find the slope, you subtract the y values in the top, that's the rise, and then subtract the x values in the bottom, that's the run. So let's do that here. Okay, I'm trying to write, and this is my goal, to get an equation that looks like this. I need to find m, I need to find b. I'm finding M right now using my slope formula. All right, so we've got 85,000 minus 60,000. So 85,000 minus 60,000, and then what would go on the bottom? 10 minus zero. What's um, 85,000 take away 60,000? Uh, let's see, yep, yeah, 25,000 divided by 10. Just cross off <coughs> zero, and we get a slope of 2,500. What does that represent about the value of the house every year in this problem? 2,500 is, is how much it goes up every year. So the value of the house is going up $2,500 a year. It's the rate of change in the value of the house. And that's what slope is. It's a, it's a rate of change. So I've got my slope. So M is 2,500. What about my y-intercept? Would it be 60,000? Yeah. If you have a coordinate that has um, a zero value for x, the y value is the y-intercept. And in this case, the y value, is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the y value is the starting value of the house. So b is 60,000. Now just write, write the answer. Y equals fill in M, fill in B. There's, the there's an equation that represents the value of the house, where X is the number of years that have gone by. 
Now, if they wanted to know when the house was worth $71,250, where would you fill in $71,250? Yeah. You'd fill it in for Y, and then you solve for X. Yeah, I'm not going to go through doing that part. Um, you should be able to handle that. But that's how you would do it. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. There's only two special cases with slope. And that's when you have a horizontal line and a vertical line. A constant function or a horizontal line is perfectly flat. It has a slope of zero. A vertical line is straight up and down, and the slope is undefined. Okay, so those are two special cases of slope. Remember, for, well, actually, I'll remind you, horizontal line is y equals a number, like we did in the rocket problem y equals 50. Vertical line is x equals a number. So these don't look like y equals mx plus b. They're a little simpler because they're special cases. You cannot graph x equals a number on the calculator. Calculator can't do it. So this is actually remind this part, we just wrote these two things down. So if you wrote it down, you don't need to write that part again. But this is giving you the coordinate 2, 3. So coordinate 2, 3. And I want to find the equation of a horizontal line that would go right through this point. And I want to find the equation of the vertical line. that would go right through that point. So what's the equation of the horizontal line that would go right through that, the point two, three? Yeah. Y equals three. Y equals three, yes. And what's the equation of the vertical line that would go right through that point? Chuck? X equals two. Yep, X equals two. And that's it. That's the equations of the two lines that would pass through, those, through that point. Any questions on that? Um, so sometimes they might give you an equation that has x's and y's in it, but it's all kind of moved around, like this one. 2x plus 3y equals 6. And sometimes we want to get y by itself. So if you had something like this, what would be your first step to get y by itself? What would you move to the other side first? Yep. The 2x over. You'd move the 2x, and how would you get rid of a positive 2x? Subtract it. Yep. Or 2x. Minus 2x. Minus 2x. <coughs> so that's better. Now we just have 3y equals. And now, how would I write the right-hand side? Keeping in mind, we're trying to get it in like mx plus b, not b plus mx. Yep. Negative 2x plus 6. Perfect. It's not wrong to write 6 minus 2x, but that's not y equals mx plus b. All right, so now if I look at this, that means my slope is negative 2 and my y-intercept is 6, right? Anybody disagree with me? Yeah. Why? I thought the slope was the number in front of x and the y-intercept was at the end. But y equals 3. Well, 3 times y. Okay, so what are you saying? You have to divide 3 by both sides. Oh, i got to get y by itself. Yes. I got you. So y, you got to make sure y is by itself. Now my slope is negative 2 thirds x and my y-intercept is 2. Okay, so the advantage of, of doing that is now if I had to graph it, I have my rise over my run and my y-intercept. It's easier to graph if you're using slope and a y-intercept. 
So that's important to know how to do. Um, point slope form is another way you can write the equation of a line. I usually never use it. If you want to use it, you can. But it's not something I really spend a ton of time with. It's just a different way other than y equals mx plus b. So <coughs> where it kind of comes in handy is if they give you a slope and a point, and you want to know what's the equation of the line that goes through that point and has that slope. So that's your m. That's your x1. That's your y1. If you fill in those three things up in that formula, that will give you the equation they're looking for. So it's y minus y1 equals m times x. Now be careful here. It's x minus minus 2. So let's just make it a plus 2. And that's an equation of a line. Now, if you wanted it in y equals mx plus b form, you could do what we just did on the other page. Get y by itself. And I would do that by distributing the 1 half out and then adding b. And now you've got y equals mx plus b. If directions don't say what format to use, this is perfectly fine. Okay, and I would accept that as an answer if they didn't say to put it in slope intercept. But they might say to put it in slope intercept. Any questions on that? Okay. Parallel and perpendicular. So in Algebra 1, this is another thing I would spend a whole day on. Talking about parallel lines and perpendicular lines. Two lines are parallel if what? Yeah? The same slope or different y intercept. Right. Same slope, different y intercept. Exactly. If you're thinking, well, why not same slope, same intercept? Well, then they're the same line. So parallel lines, same slope, different y intercept. Perpendicular, y intercept doesn't matter. But there's something special about the slopes. Does anybody remember if you have perpendicular lines what the slopes are? It's two things. It's blank, blank. Yep? Uh, one's uh, reciprocal of the other. Yep, yeah, so that's one thing. They are reciprocals and one other thing. Yep? Yeah? Uh, what do you mean by inverse? Like the opposite. Uh, one's, a positive, one's a positive, one's a negative. Yep. So for example, two thirds and negative three halves. If you draw lines with those slopes, they will be perpendicular. Opposite reciprocals. Y intercepts don't matter at all. <coughs> Okay, so let's just set this one up. If we don't need to go through the whole thing, I can, I can stop, but just to kind of show you how you would do it. Well, the first thing is, if you want to write an equation that's parallel to the one that's given, what do you have to know about the one that's given? You've got to know the, you got to find the slope. So the easiest way to do that would probably be to put that in y equals mx plus b. So start that off. I move the 3x to the other side. Okay, and what would my last step be to get y by itself? Yep, yeah, con. Divide by negative 2. Divide everything by negative 2. And really, all I care about is that. There's my slope right there. My slope is 3 halves. Now, I'm trying to find a line parallel. So what does that mean about the slope of the line that I want to find? It's the same. It's the same. So I'm going to use 
m equals three halves, and I have the point one, negative two. So you have an x, you have a y, and you have an m. That's exactly the problem we just did. You had an x, you had a y, and you had an m. You just fill them into that formula, and if you want it in y equals mx plus b form, you can do what we just did. Those are the values you need to plug in. Any questions on how you'd fill them into the formula from there? I mean, they're not the same values as the last problem, but it's the same, same type of problem. Now, the only difference if they wanted perpendicular, what would three halves change to? I thought I did it. I kind of did it up above, but not quite. Negative two-thirds. You would make it negative two-thirds and do the problem that way. I think this is the last, yeah, last thing. All right, so this is another thing. I would spend a whole day on this in algebra one, okay? Linear inequalities, but since it's um, not, you know, it's more of an algebra one topic, we can't really spend a whole day on it. But I'll just try to go over it quick. So the idea with a linear inequality is basically you're doing something like this. You're drawing a line and you're either shading above or you're shading below. People remember doing that kind of stuff? There's two options for your line. It can be a solid line or it can be a dashed or dotted line. How you tell which line to use, bless you, is if it's a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, that's solid. If it's a less than or a greater than, that's dotted. Dash. Once you figure out the kind of line, then you have to decide, should I shade above or should I shade below? Well, think less than symbols. If you have less, less is lower. Less is lower, below. Greater than, greater than or equal to, greater than is above. So anytime you have a greater than, you shade above, less than, you shade below. So that little chart pretty much sums up everything you need to know about graphing a linear inequality. And then we'll, we'll finish off with an example. Okay, any questions on that? So you just have to decide when to use a solid or dotted, when to shade above, when to shade below. Let's look at an example. So that's the inequality I want to graph. All right. Um, when we graph something, what, what form do we like it in? If it's the equation of a line, the easiest way to graph something? Yeah. Mx plus b. Yeah, we really like it in y equals mx plus b. <coughs> okay. Not saying you have to, but most people are more comfortable graphing that way, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, so, Rebecca, how would I get this in y equals mx plus b? What would be my first step? Subtract 3y from both sides. Um, you know what? We're going to move everything that's not a y. So we're going to leave the 3y where it is for now. So subtract 2x. Yeah, let's subtract the 2x. Since the y was already on the left, and we're trying to get something like this, we're going to leave the y on the left. Okay? Or in this case, it's not equals, it's less than. So minus 2x, minus 2x, 3y is less than negative 2x plus 4. And how about, um, Emily, what's my last step? Divide over by three. Right, and, and this time I don't have to worry about something that could happen, but does anybody remember what can happen when you divide in an inequality? It doesn't happen here, but it could. Doesn't it like switch directions? It could <coughs> switch direction if you do what? If you divide by a negative. Okay, I'm not going to write that down, but you need to know that. If you divide both sides by a negative, you need to flip the direction. And if you're thinking, eh, not really a big deal, well, it kind of is. It's going to change whether you shade everything above or below. So it's a difference between 
you know, getting it right, getting it wrong. But in this case, divided everything by three, that's a positive. So I end up with y is less than negative two thirds x plus four thirds. All right, so when you're graphing, remember the first thing you do is graph your y-intercept. So four thirds is about 1.3. So put a dot on one point. Just estimate. And now from 1.3, my slope tells me which way to go. To get another dot, what directions do I move? Like, down to over three. All right, down two, and which way is over? To the right. To the right. So we're going to go down two, one, two, right three. One, two, three. And if you want, do it a second time. Down two, and right one, two, three. Okay, good enough. Now I'm going to draw a line through those points. Um, Kylie, should it be a solid or dot? Mm -hmm. Dotted. Dotted, how come? Because it's not equal to. Right, it's not equal to. That means the boundary line that I'm putting right now is not part of the solution. Can't, it's not exact, but it's close. Can't be on the boundary line. Where do I have to be? Above or below? Yep, yep we're going to be below because it's um, less than. So just shade below. You don't have to shade the whole thing. You can just do something like that. Or you can shade. If you want to shade the whole thing, go ahead. I love wasting five minutes. Okay. So that stuff we just covered in 1.4, y equals mx plus b, parallel and perpendicular, graphing linear inequalities, that probably would have been about three days of stuff in algebra one. So it was quick, and we're definitely not going to go through new material that quick, but I'm, I'm hoping most of that will review stuff. Okay. All right, so um, first part that we finished up on functions, that's on page 31. And that's 32 to 36, 45, 50 to 52, and 55 to 57. And then the second part, page 42, that's all the y equals mx plus b, um, and that stuff. And that one kind of skips around. So it's 2, 8, 11, 16, 17, 20, 24, and 30, 27, 32, 44, 77. So tomorrow um, and Wednesday, we'll do sections 1.5 and 1.6. So we should be on track to finish chapter 1 um, on Wednesday.